Okay, um, let's get started. Hi everyone, uh, today is lecture nine and today we'll talk about how to train neural networks. This is part one, uh, we'll do part two on Thursday. And before we jump on to the technical details, um, some administrative notes. So yeah, so the project two um, is available, it's open. I think you should have received an announcement uh, from the canvas. Um, so the auto grader will be available today. I'm having some difficulties to um, with the Docker, so I will fix them and upload, like make, make sure it's available today for you to do the testing. And it's due, it's due on Tuesday next week. So um, this is gonna be a little bit of a crunch. So I would highly encourage you to get started if you haven't already. Um, and with the auto grader that will be available later today, I think you should be able to submit. And I'm gonna keep uh, the number of submissions per day to be five. So you have enough number of attempts that you can, um, you can, uh, you can exercise. Okay, there was a quiz today. Uh, I hope uh, you guys got a chance to uh, see that. And there'll be one on Thursday as well. Okay, so um, in the previous lecture, we talked about the history of the CNN architectures and especially looking at it with the lens of how do they perform on image net classification and looking at the error rate. And then we also like, uh, talked about the story behind like when it all started, um, what are the key differences between uh, between the network architectures and so forth. So we saw AlexNet and GFNet followed by VGG and we talked about GoogleNet. And then uh, towards the end, we kind of hinted upon uh, looking into ResNet in today's lecture. So there were a couple of interesting questions in the previous lecture that I couldn't like um, get back. So I thought I will uh, first talk about them before uh, jumping on to uh, ResNet. So the first one was, I think this was from um, uh, Carl, I guess. Um, so computation between forward pass and backward pass. So the backward pass um, definitely takes significantly more compute than the forward pass because it has multiple uh, operations, so you need to compute gradients and do uh, propagate them uh, through the network. Uh, but the forward pass is often used to compare networks because at the end of the day, we care about the inference time. So that's why like during the lecture, we were talking about um, uh, the forward pass of different architectures and how much time they were taking. So that's the difference um, in, in computation between forward and backward. And we also had a discussion about uh, the AlexNet memory requirement and why the numbers that we were seeing in the plot were different from um, the, uh, the gigabytes of memory it was using on the GPU. I think we, we, we also kind of like discussed about like maybe the batch size was, was the reason. In, indeed, that is, that is the reason here. And also during the training, um, we are not only doing the forward pass, we are doing the backward pass, which means you are you have additional memory, uh, there's weight updates happening and additional operations happening. So that's the reason behind um, splitting the model into two different uh, GPUs for AlexNet. Okay, and there was one other question, I think uh, on, um, so yeah, I, th I think I, I probably mentioned it as deeper network, but that's not correct. It's basically uh, ZFNet is bigger network than AlexNet, but the number of layers were same, eight, eight in number. Um, and I think uh, we, we also had discussion about the receptive field. So we know that the receptive field increases with number of, number of, uh, uh, number of uh, uh, filters but it can also increase if you have uh, less aggressively known sampling in your spatial dimensions. So that's what is happening here. So instead of using 11 cross 11 stride four, which was used in AlexNet, uh, we in, in, in ZFNet, it uses seven cross seven with stride two. So which means you are looking at all these uh, pixels at a higher resolution. Um, you're not like down sampling aggressively, which means it has more receptive fields and, and that results in more computing uh, requirement. So in general, it's basically um, 
uh, bigger network, which means there's, there's a lot of uh, learnable parameters and which results in more memory and compute. Any, any questions on this? Is that clear or is it still confusing? Okay. Um, yeah, so so we talked about like how we uh, in 2015 the ResNet came into picture with the use of batch normalization. It kind of jumped from having you know um, uh, uh, tens and orders of layers to hundreds uh, um, in in number of layers. So let's look at like what else does uh, ResNet had to do to to make things work. So um, once we have uh, the batch normalization. So essentially we were able to train beyond uh, just like 20 odd layers and that too without using any hacks. And, but what happens to the performance? So training is fine. We can use batch normalization to get reasonable gradients, but what happens to the accuracy? Um, apparently in their experiments, what they found was uh, the deeper models uh, don't do well. And in fact, they actually do worse than the shallow models. So here is a depiction of that, like over the iterations of training, uh, a 20 layer uh, network um, during testing performed uh, much better, meaning the error was very less compared to 56 layer uh, network. And one quick thing that we can think about from, uh, from our earlier discussions is the fact that maybe there is overfitting, right? So may, but, uh, um, uh, so the overfitting is the concept where you probably are doing very well during the training, but you are not doing well in during the testing. So this could be uh, a reason. So that's, that's the initial guess. But apparently that's not the reason. There, it was actually underfitting meaning the deeper model was not even doing as well as a shallow uh, model uh, on the training data. So this, this tells us um, uh, something a little bit more than uh, just the, this overfitting and underfitting. For instance, what is happening here is if you just like plug in, let's say at that particular trained 20 layer network followed by the extra 36 layer network, um, it should potentially perform really well, right? Because, because all it has to do is like, just pass whatever the input was uh, to the output in these additional 36 layers. But that was not actually happening. So, um, so like I said, yeah. So if you copy the layers from a shallow model and set the extra layers to identity, it should actually do as good as the shallow model. But that was not the case in this, uh, in this particular experiment. So uh, the hypothesis is that there is a optimization problem here. Um, and it's not just like copying these uh, shallower model and setting extra layers to identity would, 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 uh, should be working. So the deeper models are probably harder to optimize. And in particular, maybe they do not have a way to learn these identity, identity functions uh, so that they can just like uh, emulate the shallow models. So the solution was like, maybe we should explicitly make this identity functions. So maybe we should change the network so that the learning of these identity functions are like uh, very easy for, for the deeper networks. So that's where uh, the uh, residual concept comes in. So the plain block that you see on the left side, um, which is let's say in, in VGG, which was two con uh, layers three cross three. It takes an input x, followed by uh, uh, followed by a convolution layer, uh, which again is followed by a ReLU nonlinearity, and uh, followed by another convolution layer. So that gives you um, uh, the output of the first block that you see in uh, VGG networks. So in the ReLU block, um, you explicitly had had this short uh, shortcut where the input X is being added to the output of these two convolutional uh, layers. So this makes it such that, let's say uh, the network learns that these convolutional layers do not matter after let's say 20, 20 layers, it should potentially set these values to zero 
so that the output of this uh, potentially the shallow network could directly be the output of the entire deep network. Is that clear? The idea of why the shortcut is actually being used to um, learn these identity functions. Uh, I'm a little confused. Okay. Like, like why don't we just, uh, is it like, is the identity function there just so that we can't change the network, like remove this layers altogether or something? Um, so I think the idea is, um, so we, so, um, the bigger picture is that the more deeper the networks are, the better accuracy you get. Right. So, and then, um, these initial experiments basically says that, oh, it is not even performing as good as the shallow network, which means at least to get it to work on par with the shallow networks, we have to make the network architecture, um, in such a way that it could do this identity functions to some extent. So that is where we are currently in. So we want to use deeper networks and hopefully they should perform really well than shallow, but we are starting off uh, changing the structure of the network so that the deep networks can at least do as well as the shallow networks. Okay, understood, thank you. And potentially, like this is a very good question, like potentially what will happen is um, because of these added identity functions, and you're you're even training them. They, you're not setting them to be exactly identity. Um, the deeper networks uh, potentially can tend to perform much better than the shallow networks. That's that's the idea. Okay. Um, so similar to VGG, uh, I think ResNet is very um, uh, very popular in a, in a sense that the paper is really really. Uh, uh, um, uh, puts out a lot of these design choices, exactly like what VGG was doing. So um, they are blocking, they are like constructing the entire neural network using these res residual blocks. So the residual blocks has two um, three by three uh, convolution layers and which has a short circuit or shortcut uh, being being introduced. So, um, so yeah, so this is similar to what we saw in VGG. And they also have different stages. Um, there was a question in chat saying, is this similar to regularization? Is this similar to regularization? So no, so regularization is um, uh, what you would think about when you have overfitting, right? When your training uh, error is very low, which means your network is probably overfitting to your training data and then uh, if you want to not do that, you want to add some sort of noise um, in your training. So that's when you use regularization for your for your loss function. So this is we are, we are trying to solve underfitting here, not overfitting. Okay. So yeah. So uh, similar to VGG, residual networks have stages. Um, and specifically to note here, the first block of each stage is um, uh, is 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 reducing the resolution of the input by two. So it uses a stride of two, and then doubles the number of channels. So if you pay attention to the right side neural network, especially at every starting uh, layer, uh, there is a stride two, which means it reduces the input resolution by half, but then uh, compared to the previous stage, the number of channels gets doubled. I hope you can see that on the, on the network architecture. Okay, so uh, ResNet also uses the other um, tricks that has come out previously. For instance, in Google Net, we saw this uh, aggressive uh, stem um, in the early, like, so it takes the input, it aggressively downsamples it. So that is towards um, to the efficiency of the entire network. And at the same time, um, the ResNet also uses the global average pooling uh, inspired by what, what Google Net did. So which means you're not trying to use many 
big fully connected layers because they were uh, consuming memory as well as um, uh, the number of parameters. So you are trying to avoid that and use the same trick as Google Net by doing global, global average pooling followed by a fully connected, uh, one fully connected uh, linear layer at the end. Okay, so to uh, to give some comparisons on how um, uh, this this looks like in terms of uh, operations or um, flops, basically. So here is ResNet 18 again, like similar to VGG, the ResNet paper also uh, proposes variants of ResNet. So there is ResNet uh, 18, 34, 50, 101, 152, I think. So currently we are looking at ResNet 18 which has 18 layers. So one con layer followed by 16 uh, con layers in these uh, res uh, residual blocks, followed by one linear layer. So that's 18 in number. And uh, again, we are looking at all of this with the lens of ImageNet. So here the ImageNet top uh, five error is 10.92. And the G-flops used here was 1.8 like uh, giga flops. So comparing this with ResNet 34, so again, 34 is the number of layers there. You can see that uh, the when your network becomes more deeper, deeper, your ImageNet top five error drops. But if you compare it with VGG, um, uh, you are seeing that you are computationally very efficient as well, because you are also using the tricks from Google Google Net, like the stem um, stem block and also global average pooling. Is that, is that clear? So uh, in a way, like I think you, you should think about it like VGG is this one um, paper that came out talking about different variants and how to uh, construct your neural network architecture. And then uh, with batch normalization and residual connection came this residual networks, um, which, are, which are quite popular. Um, and they also came up with the design rules that talks about uh, how to construct your network and how it is uh, computationally efficient by using uh, the ideas from Google Net. Okay, so uh, there is also like one other block. Um, so this is the basic block that we saw in visitor networks, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there is a short shortcut from the input to the output. Um, so if uh, if you recollect how to compute um, um, the number of uh, operations, can you tell me uh, how much, how many, how many operations goes through for these two different layers? So it takes the same input and uh, gives out the same output. So the C in and C out is C. It has three by three as its filters. Um, any any guesses on like what is the number of uh, flops? for this basic residual block. Maybe you can start off with the convolution layer. It's it's super hard to not see anybody and also <laughs> expect an answer. Um, I'll, I'll wait for a, for a minute or like few seconds and, and see if somebody answers. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking for an answer for what is the number of operations uh, for these convolution layers? So the output is going to be width by e by... Yeah, yeah, I should have told you, like HW. You can assume the output to be CHW. So CHW, and then each of those will take three by three by three computation. Yeah. Right. Up to so, yes, that's correct. And then two of those. Yes. So you have two 9H uh, WC squares, and here we're talking about total flops of 18H WC square. Right. So now um, you can also have a one by one con followed by three by three, and then one by one which uh, they refer to as bottleneck residual block. 
this takes less compute um, as opposed to the basic residual block. So the one by one con, uh, again, uh, the inputs and outputs are slightly different so that, uh, because you have to think about the shortcut, because of the shortcut, you are adding the input to your f of x. So you wanna ensure that uh, the dimensions are same. So the input um, is given to one by one con that um, converts or like divides the number of channels by four. And then you do a three by three operation followed by uh, one by one that converts C to four C. So th this takes uh, uh, less, uh, less number of slots, but it has more layers to it. And uh, I also wanna add like more layers, meaning you have more, um, uh, more non-linearity added. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so the ResNet paper um, talks about different variants, 18, 34, 50, 101, 152. And if you pay attention to the error in the ImageNet classification uh, challenge, you can see that ResNet 50 is, 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 is somewhere like decent, um, given the uh, gigaflops it uses, as opposed to uh, ResNet 101 or 152. So it, it kind of uh, clearly says like how uh, deeper networks essentially perform better and better, but like you, it, it probably also gets saturated. So you need to find a trade-off between uh, the compute power and the accuracy that you care for. Okay, so yeah, during that time, I think uh, the ResNet was like performing like, like it, it was performing top like in most of the competitions around that day and and it's it's widely used even today like for instance if we have to do something in our in our in our lab if you want to train a robot perception module for something we're like oh so let's start with resonant especially resonant 50 um and then and then go from there i think it's it's it's, it's becoming a very widely used building block for for training neural networks especially for any new tasks that you that you are interested in Okay, so uh, here is a little bit of a uh, comparisons between um, all the networks that we have seen so far. Like again, on the left side, you have x-axis with uh, different neural network architectures. And then I know we only discussed some of like subset of them. On the y-axis is the top one accuracy, uh, again, on the ImageNet challenge. So you can see, especially um, uh, uh, the uh, BGG networks, um, and then followed by ResNet architecture. So the more deeper it becomes, uh, the better it is. And also um, there is inception uh, networks uh, nowadays, which borrows uh, the ideas from ResNet as well. Um, so if you're interested in that, you should, you, should, you should look into those networks. And on the right side, what you're seeing is um, how does this accuracy scale in terms of memory footprint and also the number of operations for each of these architectures. So uh, the x-axis is talking about um, uh, g-flops and the y-axis again is the accuracy. And uh, the, the width of the circle talks about the memory footprint for each of these um, architectures. So if you wanna like point out here, for instance, VGG has the highest memory. Um, uh, it's got more number of operations than the other networks. And Google Net, we, we also saw like they, are, they're fo they were focusing on trying to come up with efficient um, architecture while the accuracy was like pretty close to um, uh, the VGG network. And then we also saw AlexNet, um, um, it's, it's got a lot of parameters and comparatively less in number of operations. Um, and then ResNet, simple design. Uh, they are decently moderate in efficiency because they are borrowing ideas from Google Net and, uh, sorry, efficiency, uh, but they were also like highly um, uh, performing really well in terms of accuracy. Okay, any questions so far until this point?
Okay. So as a recap, we saw AlexNet. That's where we started. We talked about how VGG was giving us the design rules um, and also thinking about like having different convolution operations um, uh, uh, could result in efficient uh, computation. And we saw how GoogleNet was coming up with this uh, stem, um, stem, stem, uh, stem block and also uh, average, sorry, global average pooling. And also we saw that it was using uh, auxiliary um, uh, branches or network that was giving us like additional gradients because we were not able to back propagate through this huge network. And they also used um, parallel branches, uh, which they call inception. So, so, um, so that is also there in the, in the Google net. And I think uh, when, so I think AlexNet, VTG and Google net, you were not talking about batch normalization. And then to train larger networks, we had to think about batch normalization. So when batch normalization came into picture, ResNet was not there, but batch normalization was used to train VGG networks efficiently, um, which were uh, in their original work, they had to do some hack to train those networks. And then came ResNet architecture um, with the uh, residual connection. And uh, so I think that, that is where we see a huge jump in the number of layers, uh, especially in CNN architectures. Okay, um, so I think we so far discussed about architectures and their blocks and computational nodes, um, but we never discussed about, like we, we haven't started discussing about how to think about activation functions. What do we do to, uh, do the data processing, weight initialization, regularization, and also think about training dynamics and uh, uh, what can we do after training. So today we'll also like start looking into activation functions and data preprocessing, and also weight initialization. We will push the regularization to uh, next lecture, um, but after that we'll also talk about uh, training dynamics and what to do after training. Okay, so activation functions. We, we, we saw that activations functions were really important to add non-linearity to your neural network. If not, it's gonna be like you are uh, concatenating or stacking linear functions, which becomes um, deep linear uh, networks um, by itself. So, you, so adding non-linearity is, is good. Uh, the idea comes from uh, more from uh, how uh, our, um, actual neural networks are like in our brains. Um, I don't wanna like draw too many parallels to that because um, I'm not super familiar with that. At the same time, um, I think although we are inspired from there, I think it's completely different to some extent as uh, that's what I believe. But it's good to see like some parallels on like um, how you can interpret from uh, looking at biological neurons. So, um, so here we are looking at cell body or a neuron, and it is connected to uh, other neurons using these synapses. Um, and then you get inputs from these uh, other neurons uh, that comes to your neuron, and then it, which gives you some sort of scoring and followed by activation um, that as an output from your current neuron. So that's, that's, that's what is um, activation is about. And uh, I think I alluded to um, different activation functions in previous lecture, but we haven't actually went into details of each of these activation functions. So today we'll, we'll get into a little bit more detail on um, uh, what were the original set of activation functions and, and uh, where we stand right now um, in, the, in the community when you, when you look into activation functions for training your networks or uh, the choice for your uh, neural networks. Okay, um, I think one of the oldest um, activation functions that has been there for a while, uh, especially in the neural networks, um, before it became um, uh, widely used was this sigmoid uh, function. Um, there are different attributes to it or different characteristics. For instance, this squa squashes the, num uh, the, the output from zero to one, which means it has an interpretation of being um, uh, probabilities, probability values. 
So you are always getting values that are positive, <clears throat> but between zero and one. So in fact, that was some um, a sought after feature. Uh, if you look at um, biological neurons, you, it's, you, you don't want it to be like, um, just like a Boolean, zero or one to be the output. You want to have some values that says how close to one are you or how close to zero uh, is your activation is. So uh, uh, stemming from there, I think there was very, uh, very strong interest in using sigmoids because it has that particular characteristic. However, there are like drawbacks to, uh, to the sigmoid function. Again, sigmoid function is basically um, it has the changing values around zero. So especially at zero, it, the value is 0 0.5 and it increases and it saturates. And uh, when, the, when the input values are very less, um, it, the, the output is almost like zero. So the, one of the three problems here is that um, the saturated neurons um, uh, do not actually have any gradients or they actually kill the gradients. So for instance, let us take this example, right? Like we saw this in the back propagation lecture where we had a, a closer look at a particular neuron or an activation function where the input was X and the output here specifically is sigmoid. And an upstream that comes, out, um, comes from a future or the other networks is uh, this uh, derivative of the loss function with respect to this particular sigmoid gate. Right, and to compute the uh, downstream gradients, you are multiplying this upstream gradient with a local gradient. Now, let us take three examples. Right, if if x is minus ten, um, what do you think is the gradient here, or the local gradient specifically? So you, you did a forward pass, your X was minus 10 and you got a sigmoid. And then you're doing a backdrop. So I'm asking about the local gradient at the sigmoid gate. So it'll be very close to zero and slightly positive. Yeah, so it's be, it'll be a positive value, but it, it'd be like close to zero. And in fact, like here, it's, it's, it's gonna be really, really close to zero. Right, and then uh, when x is zero, you get um, you get like a good amount of gradient, and at x is equal to ten, again you are like saturating um, at one, which means your gradient is again going to be zero. So we are talking about the gradient. So the gradient is going to be zero at like minus ten, uh, I mean close to zero at minus ten and positive ten. So that is one problem. Like imagine like if you have like a large uh, neural network um, where the input for some reason was having um, uh, larger values and your sigmoid could actually always be uh, uh, triggering a gradient of uh, zero. The second problem here is that the sigmoid outputs are not zero centered. Right, so, so that has its own problems. So let's took a, take an example here. So for instance, let's consider um, one particular layer L um, where we are, we are computing um, the value of the hidden layer using this linear function. So it's basically summation or multiplication of weight matrices with sigmoid activation from the previous layer because your input to this particular layer is as an output of the activation, uh, sigma activation from the previous layer, followed by an addition of uh, a bias term. So if you compute the local gradient at this point, uh, this is gonna be, uh, sorry, if you compute the downstream uh, gradient at this point, it's gonna be a product of local gradient with the upstream gradient, right? So imagine um, that your values are uh, not centered around zero, meaning they're always positive. Your local gradient is nothing but sigmoid. So your values are always either going to be positive or negative. So it depends on like, for instance, if your 
upstream gradient is has a particular sign, let's say negative, your downstream is going to be negative as well. Your upstream gradient is positive, your downstream is, uh, is, is going to be positive as well. So if you think about it um, more from a bigger neural network point of view, this could result in having most of the gradients or all of the gradients to have a particular same sign. To give pictorial representation of why this is bad, for instance, let us take this um, plot where the x-axis is W1 and y-axis is W2. Let's say there are, we are talking only about two, two, uh, two uh, weight elements here. And uh, the desired optimal uh, direction that we want to propagate to, to optimize here is, is the, the blue arrow going uh, towards the bottom right direction. Because of this uh, same sign characteristic of using sigmoid function, you can only move um, in the direction where W1 and W2 are positive or W1 and W2 being negative. So it can only move in this zigzag direction to actually get or uh, move towards this particular optimal uh, W. Is that clear? Like, are you are you kidding? Like, why the same sign uh, uh, in uh, in sigmoid is actually problematic? Any questions on this? Okay, so in practice, this is not actually a huge problem. Um, this is definitely an issue with sigmoid functions, but in practice, when you are using mini batches, um, you you don't run into this issue. And also using batch normalization can actually avoid this. So although this is uh, an issue with sigmoid function, in practice, this is not uh, something to worry about. The other issue is the fact that there is an exponential um, component to sigmoid function. And uh, um, exponential functions are transcendental functions, which means they have some sort of loop um, in the hardware to compute the value and it becomes more expensive. But again, like um, in practice, this might not be a huge issue if you really wanna use sigmoid function. Um, this is because of the fact that uh, nowadays we do all of the training on GPUs. So most of the issues actually is to swap the memory or like, um, uh, like transfer the data from CPU to GPU that would probably be more expensive than thinking about this exponential function. So in true sense, I think the first one is probably the most problematic of the sigmoid function. So one way to th think about like, okay, how do we solve the problem in sigmoid function is looking at this tanh function. Um, if, you, if you work out the math and look at it more algebraically, tan h function is basically a, a shifted and scaled version of your sigmoid function. So here um, it's zero centered. So it's, it, it, which is good to have. Uh, the range of the output is from minus one to one as opposed to what we have in uh, sigmoid function. But still, I think the, the gradients uh, are getting killed um, in, the, in the saturation. So again, like sigmoid function and tanh functions are like um, not currently used in the, in, the, in the research, but I think uh, they, have, they are the ones that the kind of led to the other activation functions that we currently use. Okay. So that's when um, the ReLU comes into picture, our favorite activation function, where um, for any negative value or negative input, your output is gonna be zero. And for any positive value, the output is the same value. So this does not saturate like tan h and uh, sigmoid function. Uh, because of this linear trend um, uh, for, for positive values of input, it converges faster, and uh, um, uh, I think th there are reports that say this is actually like six times faster than sigmoid and tanh in, in practice. It's computationally efficient because it does not have the exponential term uh, that your sigmoid function has. So um, it's just like 
um, looking at a threshold and like computing a value from there. The negatives of ReLU um, is that again, it's not zero centered and uh, the gradient then X is uh, negative or the input is negative is, is the gradient is always um, uh, zero. For instance, let us take the similar example that we saw earlier, but for a ReLU gate. So when X is uh, minus 10, your output is zero. So which means the gradients are going to be zero. And only when X is positive, you'll have um, uh, uh, a gradient there, which is, which is one in this case. So one other way to interpret this is, um, this, this, this is a bad feature of ReLU, especially when for all of your training data, let's say um, in your neural, neural network, the ReLU activation function is, is always giving, uh, let's say zero uh, gradient, which means it's a dead neuron to some extent, and it is not actually contributing to your training. So it's never going to uh, fire a signal or never going to have a gradient to back propagate. Um, and this only happens like if this is the characteristic for all of your like training data. So we would like to see that ReLU activation uh, to have some sort of overlapping characteristics with your data cloud so that they can fire or they can lead to uh, values as opposed to being zeros. So one trick that people generally like try to uh, think about like overcoming this issue is to add some positive biases to the input to the ReLU, uh, ReLU uh, gates. Um, again, I, I would say you don't have to worry about this too much. This is like just telling you like some um, uh, uh, issues that you could run into uh, ReLU. And this, this only happens for a particular training set that, that you might be looking into. Okay, so to overcome some of these issues, especially like to keep um, uh, non-zero gradients or like let the gate not die, one, um, one other activation function that came into picture was this leaky ReLU. The, basically what's happening here, instead of like saying max of zero and X, we are saying max of alpha and X, alpha X and X, where alpha is again a um, hyperparameter that the practitioner has to decide, which means you again need to figure out like what is the right value for this alpha. Um, some good features of leaky ReLU is that it does not saturate. Again, computationally efficient, similar to what ReLU had. Uh, converges faster, um, similar to um, the, the other ReLU. There is also parametric ReLU, uh, meaning you don't wanna have this as a hyperparameter, but wanna learn through backdrop. So you can also do that. And these are some variations with, with, uh, with ReLU. Okay. So I think there are some interesting activation functions. So if you think about it, like I think one way to do research here is that, um, so they had neural network, neural network architectures sort of fixed and they were swapping between all of these activation functions to see like if, 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 uh, if, if we can come up with some better um, activation function. So that's, that's of interest for um, some researchers. So here is an exponential linear uh, unit um, it's basically uh, says that if your X inputs are positive, the output will be the same value. If the inputs are negative, um, then you have uh, um, um, an alpha multiplied with exponential function minus, uh, minus one. Again, it has all the benefits of ReLU. Um, and you can see that closer to zero uh, means you have uh, some positive outputs and it's not as what we saw in the leaky ReLU, right? It, it has some sort of characteristics and it saturates um, uh, compared to that. Um, because of the exponential function, again, it, it's, it's little higher in terms of computation. And you can also see this is an interesting one, which is Salo. Um, I think they have this um, values for alpha and gamma that they have kind of figured out. Um, 
and uh, i think this particular paper also talks about like how this this particular way of parameterizing helps the neural network do some sort of normalizing uh, by itself so they call it self normalizing property property again if you are interested in that like you should just like look into that paper and apparently you can train these neural networks without batch normalization okay so yeah so this particular paper has a lot of math if you are if you are interested in that such kind of thing i would encourage you to look into that paper and uh, more recently i think uh, there is there is a but you might see this uh, in in recent papers especially a bird gpt or uh, transformers um their uh, the activation function brings in the idea of using stochasticity to compute the activation so one simple way of looking at it is let's say you have um a random random variable x that is nothing but a gaussian centered at mean with uh, standard deviation 1 and you are always like sampling for this x and then you are checking if the input is greater than is this x or less than this x so that is where the stochasticity com comes into picture so you multiply that probability with the actual input um apparently this 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 uh, this has um uh what we call um like for instance if you look at this this plot here um especially on the negative uh, x axis there is a there is an instance where for two different negative x's your value could be the same it has a small bump um that 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 sort of has this characteristics apparently that is useful for training um uh these bigger neural networks and it gives you some some um uh essence of what we call uh, dropout we'll so we'll see dropout uh, in the next lecture but um this is an interesting activation function if you want to read more about it okay so how does these activation functions um uh, impact your accuracy So here is a plot. You have three different neural network: ResNet, there is a wider ResNet, and then Dense DenseNet. And uh, we talked about ReLU, RequeReLU, uh, parametric ReLU, and ELU, SELU, GELU, and like you know all of these activation functions. If you look at them, um, the performance is not. You don't actually see a pattern, right? Like for instance, um, in uh, let's let's pick one here. So in DenseNet, you have uh, the gelu performing almost same as your relu so they are, they have same performance whereas on the resnet you have gelu to be like 1% more accuracy or like like close to 1% more accurate than the other one so the 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 deltas that you actually get are very small and uh, the, the 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 trend does not hold for different neural networks so in a in summary um don't think too hard um just use relu and if you really really want to squeeze that you know extra percentage performance then you can play around with the other activation functions and uh, do not use sigmoid or tanh because you know they have their own limitations and and that's you don't want that okay So that's the summary on activation functions. I will pause here for a for a bit to see if you have any questions. Okay. Um so the next thing that we will discuss is data processing. Um one way to look at this is like what we discussed about in batch normalization so batch normalization we are talking about a layer for which there was an input tensor coming from a, a different layer and then we said okay in order to keep um the optimization tractable we wanted to we want to make sure that we do normalization such that the input values to a layer is always kind of bounded here we are talking about actual data the raw data that is being fed into uh, the neural network so 
um, similar to the batch normalization, we wanted to see that it is actually centered around zero. And the, the standard deviation is not um, um, too significant along a certain directions. So this is what we want to do uh, for the input data. And there are like different ways of doing it. So you can also do uh, 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 what we call PCA, which is principal component analysis or whitening of data, uh, where we are trying to basically uh, um, make the data have diagonal covariance matrix or make the covariance to be identity. So these are a couple of things that you would you would find um, uh, uh, as a trick to do the data pre-processing before you feed that into neural network. Especially you'll see that in data loaders um, for training neural networks. Uh, the idea here is uh, if, if you don't do the normalization, let's say uh, your data is like kind of spread out, um, a small change in your weight matrix or small change your, in your parameter can have a huge change in your loss. So your loss is very sensitive to your weight matrix. And this, this characteristic would make um, your training uh, harder, especially for the optimization routine to, um, to solve for a good weight, uh, good parameters. So after the normalization, you can imagine that um, it is less, the loss function is less sensitive to small changes in W. So it, it becomes a little easier to optimize. So he, this is the fundamental uh, reason for, for doing data pre-processing. And uh, now like, let's look at like, what do we need to do for um, doing the pre-processing for images specifically? So there are three things you can do. One is you can subtract the mean uh, image. So that's, that's, that's what AlexNet does. So they compute what they call as mean image which has um, 32 cross 32 as the spatial dimension and three channels for RGB. Uh, the other trick that you can do is subtract uh, per channel mean. So you'll have one number for each of uh, the channels. For, R R for red, you'll have one number. For, for green and blue, you'll have one and one numbers. So this is what a VGG network did. So this is trying to commu uh, compute these values uh, across the training data. The other trick you can do is you can compute the mean, subtract the uh, mean for each of your data, and you can also divide by per channel standard deviation. So this is what ResNet did. You will see that often, especially for images, uh, people, people are not um, uh, using PCA or principal component analysis or whitening strategies to, to do this. So this is, this is what you'll commonly see in the, for, uh, for pre-processing for images. Any questions here? Is Are these three like uh, clear? Okay. Um, let's look at what we mean by weight initialization. Um, so we have to initialize the weight to something, right? Like for instance, um, one way, one simple way to think about it is like initialize all the weights to either zero or a constant. So with this, what will happen is, especially when you do it with zeros, all your outputs are zeros, so the gradients are going to be like the same. And if you make your um, weight initialization to be constant, you are going to have symmetry in your in your in your neural network. So every weight is going to be the same. So you have to um, kind of break the symmetry by initializing them randomly. One common strategy to do here is to have small random uh, numbers. I think this is what you did for your uh, first uh, project. You might do the same thing for your second as well, where it is uh, the small random number is centered around um, uh, zero Gaussian with standard deviation of let's say 0 0.01 in this case. This works really well, especially for small networks that you are currently like implementing. Um, but for deeper networks, they have issues. So let's understand like, what do we need to do for deeper networks? So we have to look at what we call um, uh, activation statistics. So for instance, let us take this example where we will do a forward pass for a six layered 
uh, network with a hidden size of uh, 4096. So uh, we have an input, we are randomizing the input, uh, but we are interested in the weights. So we are, we are just randomizing the inputs to, to understand what happens to it. Um, so the activations tend to be, tend to become zero over the networks, like especially in the six layer new network. So initially in the first layer, you had some sort of uh, values between minus one and one. But if you see over the layers, especially in the sixth layer, the activations are like close to zero. Which means what, what do you think, um, or how do you think the, the gradients are gonna look like for, for this particular uh, six layer neural network? Any 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 thoughts? They're gonna be like really really small. Yeah, so they're gonna be like really really zero, like almost. Th th there's not gonna be any learning because the activation is gonna be zero. So um, they're gonna be really really small, almost zero, in this case. Now let us try to bump bump up the uh, standard deviation to uh, 0 0.05 instead of 0 0.1. Now you'll see a completely different characteristic here. Here you'll see that the, saturate, uh, uh, the activations are being saturated between minus one and one by just like increasing 0.01 to 0 0.05 for the weights. Uh, again, this is also not good, like because like your local gradients are all zero, and again there is no there is no learning happening. So we have to find some sweet sweet spot. Um, that will make um, uh, the network learn or have a good amount of uh, activations. So um, Xavier initialization, which came out from this particular paper in 2010, um, scales the activations uh, for all of these layers. So with that, you will see this nice characteristics of like you have values, uh, the activations are like reasonably good. They're not like, um, uh, getting to zero. And this particular weight initialization is very commonly used. And here, like if you, I don't know if you guys already noticed in the past three examples, I used tan h as, uh, as an example here. Although we said we should not be using tan h. Right, now like, let's see what happens to this when we move from um, uh, tan h to ReLU with this particular Xavier initialization. So, um, so this actually comes back to the original problem where your activations are collapsing to zero, especially this particular trend is for ReLU. So you can see that there are no activations, there are no, there are no um, um, negative activations. All of them are uh, positive, but like all of them are close to zero. So there is no learning happening here as well. One trick that they proposed to solve this is to um, uh, have a standard deviation the square root of two divided by the dn. So this apparently solves the problem and you have good amount of activations uh, between the range of zero and one. Okay, so some more discussions on weight initialization, especially with, with respect to residual networks. Um, we just wanna briefly look into this and understand um, how this could affect uh, residual networks because you have this short, short circuit or um, where you are using the input um, and adding that to your, um, your function. Um, so, so one problem that we'll have is the variance of um, the output when added to the input is greater than the variance of the input itself. And this will grow for each block in your residual neural network. One way to account for this is to say that for the first convolutional uh, network, I, we will use the approximation that we saw earlier for ReLU, but for the second one, we will make it to zero. So the second uh, con layer, the, the, the weight initialization will be to zero. So this apparently solves this uh, problem of variance growing uh, for each of the residual block. Okay, so they, they, there is a lot of active research in this in this area, like how to uh, initialize the weights, because 
um, weights are the parameters of your neural network and um, and uh, training is basically trying to update your weights such that your performance is is better so it's it's actually a crucial problem and and uh, there's been a lot of research happening uh, in this space i've heard good things about the lottery ticket which is the last paper and if you're interested you should should uh, you should at least like try to look into that I think there is a question on the chat. Can somebody read it for me, please? It's just the confrontation saying there are many more questions. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I think that brings us to like, okay, now um, let's say your model is overfitting with all, with, with all of this um, things that you did. You looked at activation, you did um, uh, uh, weight initialization, you also talked about uh, data pre-processing, but what happens to, uh, uh, what happens if you're, if you're seeing the trend of overfitting? Uh, we'll discuss this in the next class, um, where we'll talk about again, uh, the, the, the training dynamics, and also we'll 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 discuss about what to do after your network is trained. How do we do more model ensembling, and also like transferring your learning to um, let's say a different task. Okay, so yeah, in the next lecture we'll talk about uh, again uh, training neural networks. It will be part two, and that is the end of uh, today's lecture.